we're really enthused to see so many people that have registered to join with us tonight um, for our conversation about large old hero trees. Um, this event is part of our BioLinks Alliance We Want Your Hollow Promises campaign that we're running throughout June. We have a digital campaign hosted through Chucked and have set a goal to raise $15,000. Uh, we'd like to start with first acknowledging um, with an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge that I am hosting this meeting from the lands of the Zsa, Zsa Warren. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you are meeting from today and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this meeting. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Victoria. Tonight, we have two expert contributors from BioLink Science to our discussion. Chris Popney, who's our conservation ecologist, who will speak to you about the importance of large old trees, the dire threats that they face, and what you can do to protect these elders of our landscapes. We also have Cameron O'Mara, our local to landscape facilitator, who will speak to you briefly about our Hero Trees pilot project that he's been facilitating since its inception 18 months ago. Uh, both will be available for your questions and comments at the end. Um, so I'll now hand over to Chris. Sunja, I'll just get this presentation up and going. Hopefully we can all see that. So as Georgia mentioned, uh, I'm an ecologist with BioLinks and um, it's really great to see such a big turnout for this, this event tonight. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. I am obviously going to talk to you about large old trees, why they're important, and particularly uh, why hollows are so important as, as a habitat feature. Um, large old trees in general are hard to define. Uh, it's very context specific. The same, same species of tree in two different areas can, can look very different. And uh, so we can't always just use size, for example, as a judgment. Um, but things like features such as hollows uh, can be can be a really good guide as to the age of a tree. Um, and, and there's more and more data out there now as well about growth rates of trees in different habitats. But I guess why we're here today talking about this is um, the marked decline of, of large old trees throughout our landscape, particularly in um, some really fragmented areas of central Victoria. So since 1997, um, we've actually lost half of the large old trees that scientists have been monitoring right across Australia, which is um, pretty confronting in the last 26 years. So large trees are obviously um, super important from an ecological point of view. Um, they provide habitat and food for hundreds and hundreds of fauna species, um, even in paddocks where these trees are disproportionately important uh, when they're acting as stepping stones and sort of islands of habitat in the landscape. So we obviously, you know, we all, know about our gliders and possums that use use these hollows. Um, many bird species use hollows, but there's often sort of underappreciated uh, microbats, uh, insects and amphibians even will use hollows, things like tree frogs will use hollows for um, for shelter. Large trees also really promote good soil health. Um, so fallen leaves return nutrients to the soil as they decompose uh, and they help with water retention as well. They provide connectivity in fragmented agricultural landscapes. Um, these large trees in, in paddocks, again, really act as, as stepping stones, which is super important for many species to move between sort of bigger patches of habitat. And there's a whole bunch of, of flow on sort of ecosystem effects, um, you know, relating to food webs and things like that, that large old trees influence. So for example, if you, if you take trees out of uh, out of a landscape and you have a decline in microbats, then you know the numbers of flying insects will increase uh, exponentially with without those bats there and that obviously causes causes issues and um, discomfort for us. Um, trees can also help with uh, erosion control. So roots, you know these these trees have massive root systems and that helps to stabilize the soil uh, and uh, vegetation in the landscape helps organic matter to accumulate and and really build that that topsoil layer over time as well. But trees are um, large trees are important to us as well. They've got a range of cultural values across the world um, in in really site specific contexts. 
and they're just attractive. They're nice to look at. They're a source of pride on people's properties. They provide us shade as well as um, shade and shelter for the livestock. Uh, they provide landmarks in some of these landscapes and um, features like shelter belts on properties to provide, um, to reduce the impacts of wind and, and sediment erosion and things like that uh, in, in really largely cleared landscapes. They can have um, some really interesting and sort of not obvious impacts on things like soil salinity as well. So without trees, sometimes you can get the water table actually rising. Um, and this, the water increases in salinity because it's absorbing the salt that's normally stored in soil. Whereas when trees are in the landscape, they're absorbing more of this water and helping the water table stabilize and, um, and not, not take a lot of this salt out of the soil. And even, um, you know, we, from an ecological point of view, fallen limbs are ideally left on the ground, but you know, a small amount of collection of firewood can be a really good compromise to, um, to bring people along and, and get people on board with, with maintaining uh, large old trees in the landscape as well. So these are a handful of the threatened species uh, relevant to central Victoria that, that use large old trees and specifically hollows. Um, so things like barking owls, uh, they are associated with areas of, of high hollow density. Um, our gliders use hollows to, to nest in, as do our fascigales. Um, powerful owls and greater gliders require really big hollows, which, you know, we're talking trees that are sort of 200 plus years old to get a hollow big enough for a um, powerful owl in general. Um, lace monitors, not many people would think of as a, as a hollow dependent species, but they'll shelter in hollows and they'll... Um, They'll find a lot of their food sources in hollows as well. They'll eat eggs and things like that. Um, and then besides hollows as well, large old trees provide really good flowering resources for things like our swift parrots to feed on in central Victoria. Uh, and um, I think people would be sort of, many people are sort of surprised at the number of our woodland birds that use hollows as well. So things like tree creepers will, will nest in hollows. And so I want to touch on uh, a couple of really good examples of uh, from the literature of, of species relying predominantly on large old trees, um, generally with a focus on agricultural fragmented landscapes. So this first study uh, from Doratel looked into uh, the dispersal and foraging behaviour of woodland birds in a fragmented landscape. Uh, this is in New South Wales, but the bird assemblage is really similar to, to what we get in central Victoria. There's, um, they look at species like brown tree creepers, white-throated tree creepers, uh, fuscus honey eaters, white-plumed honey eaters, and, and yellow robins. So really familiar species probably for a lot of us. And they wanted to assess uh, the movement of, of these birds from remnant patches and what features in the landscape were important for, for functional connectivity. So what, what defines a connected landscape for these birds. Um, the most relevant findings, I suppose, from this for us was the use of scattered trees uh, to traverse gaps in the landscape. So the graph on uh, the left is shows the percentage of observations of birds using uh, corridors or scattered trees. And the authors separated brown tree creepers in the black bars um, from all other species in the white bars just as a species of focus. And the hatch bars are the relative proportion of both that were available in the landscape. So we can see that brown tree creepers use uh, scattered trees at a higher, a higher rate to, to the proportion that actually available in the landscape. So that sort of suggests that brown tree creepers were, were more likely to use scattered trees to traverse the landscape than, than corridors, um, which is sort of a bit, goes against what you might expect. Uh, the other species were pretty close to using both features in the proportions that they were present. On the right, we've got the average gap distances um, between habitat point trees that these birds traversed. And again, the thatch, uh, the hatch bar is the average gap in the landscape between habitat for these birds. So pretty consistent across all species. Um, they all on average traversed gaps less than 80 meters. 84% of brown tree creeper movements were gaps less than 100 meters. 
and 88% of all other species were less than 100 metres. So from a management point of view, this sort of tells us that these woodland birds will use, um, use trees as stepping stones if the gaps are within or, or less than 100 metres um, 100 metres long to move between habitat patches. But once you get over that threshold, these, these trees are effectively isolated and, and no longer connected um, to these birds. Uh, consistently, fragmentation is, is bad for woodland birds, um, but the presence of large trees can mitigate some of these impacts. And there's lots of examples throughout, throughout the, um, the scientific literature and sort of a couple of really pertinent ones here. So this top study from Montague Drake found the number of paddock trees within 500 metres of study sites was a really important um, predictor of whether these birds were occupying sites. Um, and it had a strong positive impact in nine out of the 13 species. So really, um, really strong influence there. Fisher and Lindenmeyer looked at the importance of paddock trees for birds as well and found the vast majority of the birds they observed used paddock trees at, at one time or another. So that's um, out of the 55 bird species they observed, 44 they saw using paddock trees. Uh, and this graph is a little bit unclear, but basically shows a point for each species uh, at the intersection of the number of paddock tree sites and the number of woodland patch sites that, that bird species was observed at. Um, and it is, it, it's a bit noisy, but there's um, a pretty consistent trend that uh, with this ratio of paddock trees versus patches being used um, and sort of suggests in, in the most simple form um, that that most of these birds will use woodland, uh, will use paddock trees quite readily. They also um, sat at individual trees and looked at birds' arrival and departure directions and found a really high proportion of birds, well, evidence for a really high proportion of birds using these trees specifically as stepping stones. So arriving from one direction and, and departing, heading in the same direction. Uh, and barking owls, as a, as a threatened species in Victoria, they're really, a really clear example of a need uh, for large old trees in the landscape. So they have a really strong bias towards site with a high density of large trees and hollows. Um, so hollows were two to three times more prolific at sites where barking owls were found versus sites where barking owls were absent. Another one of our um, threatened species that occurs throughout central Victoria, uh, the squirrel gliders who um, they, they rely on large old trees for nesting in hollows, but also as a food source. They um they really make the most of of big uh, flowering blooms in in large trees, uh, and they'll also eat a lot of invertebrates and tree saps and things like that. So Mason Crane's uh, work through through ANU looked into squirrel glider foraging and denning behaviour, and that again in a fragmented agricultural sort of landscape. They carried out spotlight surveys in remnant habitat versus replanted areas and found basically gliders weren't using revegetated areas that were younger than 10 years. So um, it was the, the 10 year old plus area that the gliders were using. Uh, but their occupancy was was more than more than double in remnant sites. So they were really preferring these older, older, larger trees and, and sites with large trees. And then within the landscape, um, Mason uh, radio collared and, and tracked 32 gliders over five months. All gliders were denning in eucalypts, as you'd expect. Um, and they, they were largely denning in, in dead trees. Um, but this was simply due to dead trees having more hollows than the living trees in the landscape. Um, if, if the living tree had, had hollows, the gliders actually preferred living trees. And individual gliders use an average of seven den sites within the home range. So you can imagine to have a have a sustainable population of, of these gliders, how many hollows you need across the landscape to support them if, if each individual is using an average of seven. Um, they'll forage foraging mostly in, in big eucalypts, um, but occasionally in acacias. And uh, they 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 have this really clear pattern of moving from low-lying areas to the upper slopes when flowering trees uh, were available, particularly red ironbark, favoured of theirs when it, was, when it was flowering, and that occurs up in those ridges and the upper slopes. 
And then when flowering stops, they move back to the low-lying areas. So this is a really clear um, connectivity issue. And that's that's a big, um, again, that stepping stone role that, that these large trees play. Um, these gliders can, can glide up to 50 metres between trees. But um, similar to the birds with that, Hundred meter threshold. As soon as you, as soon as you go further than that, it's basically an isolated, uh, an isolated fragment. As far as these animals are concerned, because um, squirrel gliders pretty much won't come to the ground. So it just um, emphasizes the importance of maintaining connectivity with large old trees in the landscape, so they can come, uh, come to and from the low lying areas and and the slopes, and. Um, also the importance of, of looking after the remnant habitat that we have because the the tree planting the tree plantings and um revegetated areas were were rarely used. A really interesting um thing that came out of this study as well was that gliders specifically preferred gathered paddock trees. Um possibly because they were all big, they were all really old trees, um, providing they were within gliding distance. And when scattered trees were in the home range of a glider, those gliders actually maintain smaller home ranges. And so when they had remnant patches or roadsides, they were requiring a larger home range. And the authors sort of put that down to, um, again, these large, just, just the sheer age of these large trees, they'll have probably multiple hollows. Uh, and when they flower, they're probably producing a really really large amount of food for these gliders. Um, so again, these scattered old trees have a really disproportionately high value in the landscape. So we all know, I guess, how important large trees are, um, <clears throat> but why are they threatened? And this is recognised as a really significant threat. Uh, a loss of hollow bearing trees is listed as a threatening process in the Victorian Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act. So we know it's a major issue uh, for many species. And it's largely caused by caused by us, caused by land clearing over the last 200 years. Um, big trees were obviously targeted for timber uh, and still are, and, and whole forests have, have been lost. And then this is really exacerbated by a lack of recruit, recruitment. Um, the trees that are two, three, 400 years old and are starting to senesce in the landscape, uh, those subsequent generations of trees haven't come through and that's, through a combination of um, combination of factors, that things like grazing, slashing, um, fire, and and just poor soil health has really prevented that those generations of trees from filling those gaps in the landscape, and that's where we've got this um this sort of missing missing link um, throughout a lot of our landscape. Um, too much of certain nutrients can can be a massive issue. For, for large trees, um, you know, nutrient overloads in, in certain ratios can kill mycorrhizal fungi uh, and prevent plants from uptaking uh, a range of essential nutrients. And this, um, you know, the use of excessive, the excessive use of, of fertilizers can really throw out that natural balance um, in the soil and with the fungi and the interactions with, with trees there. Soil compaction, um, which can be due to uh, can be due to stock. So, you know, obviously, uh, I guess Australian soils and Australian landscapes didn't um, didn't evolve with with hard food, uh, large herbivores. So, so this soil compaction uh, is quite a new a new thing to deal with for, for our ecosystems um, and vehicles. So, large trees on roadsides suffer from soil compaction just from just from being next to a road as well, uh, and that limits how much water gets into the soil and is available for trees, but also limits root growth. And so if, if the roots can't grow as deep, basically the tree has a higher center of gravity and then is more prone to falling as well. Um, fire is, is an issue as well at the moment. Um, it's obviously an important part of, of many native habitats in Australia, but generalizing, um, particularly in Southeastern Australia, we've really got the balance wrong. The fire regimes are, uh, are largely inappropriate. Um, across the last sort of 150, 200 years. And, um, and that's really contributing to a loss of, of many of these trees uh, and drought. You know, plenty of our species are adapted for some level of drought as is normal in Australia, but um, they can't adapt quickly enough to the increased severity and frequency and the duration of droughts that we're seeing. Um, so there's really sort of 
grim but interesting um, article in in the Guardian about this study that was only native forests uh, coincidentally in the period leading up to the Black Summer bushfires and showed massive dieback before the fires came through, um, attributed to to drought stress through a, a long period of severe drought. So that's all a little bit um, a little bit grim, but um, you know there are things we can do. It's Seems really simplistic um, and cliched, but raising the profile and appreciation for large old trees in our community uh, it is vital. It's a vital first step. You know, our, um, all of you guys listening in on this and, and all of our local communities are going to be our greatest allies if we want to conserve habitat on private land in particular. And having community on board and having local champions and things like that um, is really the first step to being able to implement any of the more direct actions that we can do to, to give these trees a helping hand. At a, at a property level, um, fencing around trees or, or resting paddocks to exclude stock can improve soil conditions for these trees, uh, minimise compaction and, and allow recruitment by, by minimising grazing pressure on seedlings. Um, and this doesn't have to be, you know, a massive area that's excluded either. It can be, it can be as little as um, the diameter of the of the canopy of the tree, just just to that outer, what we call the drip line. Um, but you know, the bigger the better, from our point of view. Um, avoiding excess fertilizer use. So there's lots of great resources available now with, um, I guess, inspiration for ways to increase productivity without excess fertilizer use. Um, you know, the regen ag movement is a is a big thing, and uh, there are a lot of case studies out there now of people managing productivity with nature rather than um, rather than sort of against working against nature. Uh, and I think an important thing to keep in mind to sort of touch on is the importance of roadsides as well. So as far as public land goes, um, and and in the in these fragmented landscapes, a lot of the best habitat that's left is on roadsides, and it's often under underappreciated. Um, but you know where you see stretches of roadside with with nice big trees, if there's if there's a trend of dieback and things like that, and it's it is really worth raising concerns with your local council and um and and or uh, government agencies and things like that to to keep tabs and and make sure these these pieces of habitat are still there because they're they um they provide a, again that really disproportionate amount of, of connectivity through our landscape along the roadsides. So what are we doing? Um, we have a, a citizen science large old tree mapping uh, hero tree program, which Cam will talk a bit about in a minute, so I won't go too much into that. Um, we've, we've worked with multiple local primary schools around the Heathcote region, getting kids to measure large old trees and draw, draw their trees on, uh, that, that occur on their school, um, teaching them about the animals that rely on large old trees and things like that. And just engaging landholders, you know, I think something really consistent we've found is that people are proud of large old trees on their properties. And um, if they don't have the expertise, they, they want to know how to look up their trees in general. And we've had, um, yeah, quite a few projects in the work on, on private properties and we're starting, starting to get things happening with, um, firstly, some surveys, really exciting. We've found some fasca gales and gliders and antichitis and all that. Uh, using large trees on people's properties, and then the next steps are to look at how to enhance um, enhance the health of these trees and and habitat for these species. And we also uh, have heaps of great resources through our um, our knowledge hub for a range of range of audiences as well. I'm just going to play. This is going to work. A quick little video, which you might have seen doing the rounds on social media from us.
Hey, Chris, is the sound on? <laughs> None of the sound I just got through, but um, you can find that on, on our socials and on YouTube if, if the muted video got, uh, got your attention. Um, anyway, that's enough from me. I'll hand over to Cam to um, give you all a bit of information about our our Hero Tree program. Lovely. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so um, like Chris said, uh, it's sort of my job to turn a lot of that science into, into on-ground action. So I work in the, the Heathkit region mainly, but um, Heathkit is really just a pilot that we want to expand to, to multiple different areas across central Victoria. So we're really, we're really viewing this as a, as a, as a model for, for expanding the protection of large old trees across the entirety of central Victoria and really elevating the profile of, of large old trees as an asset. Um, and we all have sort of an innate sense of just how much of an asset these trees are, um, like Chris said, aesthetically, but you know, the value that they provide to the ecosystem is just, it, it can't be, um, stated enough really so um what you're seeing on the screen now is uh that the sort of poster that we've been using to to promote um the the project in the in the Heathcote region and it, what it does is it enables people to go um onto an app that we've created that um lets you map a tree a significant tree um that you you might have at your place now you don't need to be in Heathcote to to do this you can you can do it from anywhere um, what it will do is if, if we, if we start getting a lot of hits from outside of Heathkit, you know, it might even help us leverage, um, that local government area or that catchment to promote a, a project within that region. And, um, yeah, it, it's really, really valuable because, um, it's, it's not just getting people engaged with the, with it, but it's actually seeing where these trees are in the landscape and, um, the more people that do it, the, the more that we can, um, understand about the the types of demographics of the people that are interested in this stuff as well as where these trees are in the landscape so both really really important things for us to understand so yeah we do want to expand the project into new areas and we are in talks with with various different uh, local governments and um, catchment management authorities to to try and um, get the project as widespread as possible and we do have all of the infrastructure built to, to be able to do that and to be able to expand it as widely as we can. So uh, Chris touched briefly on it as well, but the, the main thing that we're really focusing on is the, the problem of the hundred, what we're calling the hundred year gap. So it takes about a hundred years for a tree to um, get to the maturity where it has hollows. So there's, a, there's a, quite a few processes that have to take place. You have to have large enough limbs um, growing on the tree that then fall off and then create a scar. And then that scar gets rotted out by funguses and whatever else. And then that forms the hollow. So um, those, those processes take time and um, much of central Victoria was uh, completely felled and then grazed and then gold mined and whatever else. Um, so there, there really is just those, the, mostly it's paddock trees that are, that are remaining that are in that sort of significantly old um, age bracket where they have multiple hollows and they can support a wide range of different species of hollows of different sizes and things like that. Um, so, so what we're focusing on is, is the, the trend line for those trees is steadily going downwards and the trend line for, for trees that are going to replace them um, at the, the intervals that we want are just not they're not matching that replacement. So we, we want to be able to be more strategic with the way that we, we um, do landscape restoration. So there's a few things that we can do. And there's a few things that I talk about with a lot of landholders that we can do. Um, so a lot of the time I, um, when I'm talking to landholders, I try and, um, you know, not, not dissuade them from doing shelter belts because they're really important as well, but um, maybe doing more focused and targeted replanting of trees um, at sort of spacings at about you know 80 meters apart and then protecting individual trees so instead of fencing off huge areas and um, you know cutting off large areas of, of your grazing land to, to stock um, you're only you're only doing very small 
targeted planting. And you think about, you know, what, what impact is that going to have in, in 50 years, in 100 years time, you know, when we're not even around anymore? Um, what, what impact is that going to have on, on the landscape? So try, trying to think from, from that sort of long term framework is, is what, we, what we try and do at BioLinks a lot. Um, and another thing that we can do, which is, which is really, really easy a lot of the time, is leveraging um, those existing trees, things like those roadsides that Chris talked about. You'll see it when you're driving through the landscape. Um, there'll be uh, a single large tree in a paddock and it hasn't had stock in it for, a, for a, a few seasons maybe. And there's just all of this passive regeneration coming up. So how do we manage that passive regeneration? Um, you know, there might be too much regeneration, especially with things like red gums. So do we, do we go through and we thin it out or um, do, we, do we try and encourage that um, to, to promote the, the regrowth that is, you don't even have to plant any trees, basically. You can just sit there and watch it take place. Um, yeah, Chris also mentioned roadsides, and you'll, you'll see that a lot when you're driving around central Victoria. Um, there'll, be, there'll be all of these large grey boxes and red boxes along the side of the roadside, and they're beautiful trees. We're really lucky that we, we didn't clear all of the roadsides completely. Um, there's still quite a bit of remnant large old trees along those roadsides. Um, and you can just fairly easily see there'll be, a, there'll be an assemblage of, of various aged trees um, springing up on the, on, the fence, on the other side of the fence in the, in the private property. And a lot of the time, if you, if you simply just allow that passive regeneration to take place, um, you, you will get huge benefits um over time and it, you don't even have to exclude stock necessarily um forever you could you can do it periodically you can just do some small stock exclusion um for for short periods of time just allowing that vegetation to get to the age where it can no longer be easily grazed down to nothing by by the stock and um yeah that that can have a really really big impact on the the overall landscape so those are some of the things that we try and do um, one big thing as well is um, trying to uh, teach people how to assess the health of their large old tree. Um, and it's a, quite a difficult thing. It's a, it's a holistic sort of thing that you have to really think about, um, you know, the, how, how to assess the health of a tree, you know, looking at the, the shape of it, what are the issues, um, you know, there's, it's never one thing alone that causes tree decline. It's always a multitude of factors. So we're, we're trying to put together some materials um, to that'll be available to everyone that, that they can um, they can you know assess the health of their tree. So that's another thing that we want to come out of this program. So I think I'm getting the the cutoff time for Georgia. So no, we're you're good, fantastic. We're good with questions. We appreciate all your expertise and um, contribution there, Cam. <laughs> um, no, you. it's incredibly interesting. No, just. Um, noticing the time is ticking. So I thought we might take some questions. There's some really interesting comments and questions happening. Um, I'll start with Adriana's, which is in Victoria, is there an obligation for trees planted as part of approved development to ensure they reach old age with hollows? Um, the further comment is this is not part of DA approvals in New South Wales. And I think that is an issue because nobody monitors establishment and retention of planted trees. I may throw this one to you, Cam, is that? Yeah, as far as I'm aware, as far as I'm aware, there isn't. And it's something, it's interesting, uh, you should, um, depending on which um, local government area you are in, um, it'd be worth looking up what their strategy is, because um, a lot of governments are releasing new biodiversity strategies and climate strategies that have huge impacts on this kind of legislation. So um, I know City of Greater Bendigo, which is where we operate in, um, they have a lot of this kind of information in their new upcoming biodiversity strategy. So yeah, it, it seems like there will be more of an emphasis on this going forward. Um, and, and it's just mostly it's how you actually administer it because it's really difficult thing to do, um, you know, to keep on top of, but, you know, remote sensing and all of those kinds of things are becoming more and more utilized in this kind of space. And um, I think that'll have a huge impact on that as well. Fantastic. We've got a question here from Heidi. Does the hero tree mapping work for public crown land, um, including roadsides or just private property? 
I'll throw that one also to you, Cam. You can you can do it wherever you'd like. I'm interested in any significant tree that you can you can dig up and or not dig up, but any significant <laughs> tree you can find. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, you can do it on any tree, but um, really we are trying to look for for trees um, on private property. But if you see a significant tree, um, then yeah, please please don't hesitate to to map it. And a further comment from uh, Vondo is, is there a minimum size tree diameter to map? Um, there are trees that are, that are quite small, but um, still very, very mature. It doesn't necessarily mean that a tree, if a tree is small in stature, that it's not really, really old. So um, it doesn't need to be large and old, just mature and have some hollows or um, even some unique characteristics. Um, you know, something that makes it special um, in any way, in any way at all. And a question for a uh, question from Louise. Um, can BioLinks influence the local council? I understand there is legislation which should stop the clearing of lots, but the council refuses to enforce this legislation. I, I can feel that one. So um, as far as local council goes, that there are some really good people working within um, within City of Greater Bendigo at the moment. Um, and we do work cl quite closely with them and we have a really good relationship with them. And we've managed to um, be quite involved with the, with the development of the biodiversity strategy that they've, that they've put together. And I think so. I'd like, I, as if, these, if these strategies mean anything to the, to the way that these organisations, these um, you know, councils are, are running themselves, then yes. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know in a few years, I suppose. Um, there's lots of great comments also happening in the chat function if you want to check those out. Um, I probably won't be able to read them all out just simply because of time. So I'm just jumping to the questions, but please go and check out the comments as well. Um, where trees are pruned, this is from David, uh, where trees are pruned by councils, is it possible to create a sped up version of a hollow by boring out the suitable cut limbs. This will degrade the tree, but would close the hundred year gap. Interesting question. Uh, Chris or Cam? Chris maybe? Sure. Uh, yeah, Cam, we've, we've actually, had a few discussions about this actually. At we a, have. Um, right, in different ways. And yeah, there's, there's people doing that stuff. It's it's doable. Verified. Um, <laughs> yeah, no idea what the, um, how much it costs and that sort of thing, but there's, so there's, there's a few different things that they do. So there's art, there's called artificial tree hollows. So that's um, generally the, the, the way that you do it is you use a, you use a chainsaw to do a few plunge cuts and you create a, a small opening in the tree. Um, so it's basically, yeah, speeding up that process. And the councils do do it. Um, I know I, I'm in Seymour and there's the, the council's done it down at um, Goulburn Park. So, um, you know, they're not, there's no obligation to do it, but I'd love to see it happening more often. And then there's also, I know that it's been done out at, um, at uh, Wombat State Forest, uh, Wombat, soon to be National Park. Um, they, they've been doing some trials with, with drilling. So they use a, a drill that, um, that extracts all the material and just, and bores out a, a hole. And then, um, so you can, you can do various size hollows basically. And we know that, um, you know, natural hollows are much better thermal, like thermally, they're much better at, um, at you know, sustaining the, the animals that live inside them. So um, animals prefer, wildlife prefers those, especially things like powerful owls, which there's been almost no success with artificial, um, you know, boxes and things. So um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a big problem. Just a follow up question from Louise um, about biolinks and uh, can and bio Biolinks influence local councils, and you spoke about Bendio Council. She's just wondering if we it's if we can do the same with Macedon. I'd I'd absolutely love to do the same with with every mm -hmm. local council. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll keep putting our shoulder to the wheel in as many ways as we can, I suppose. But it's outside my jurisdiction at the moment. I'm just saying. Any questions we don't get to, by the way, we will absolutely come back to you on um, and provide any information that we can um, to, to help you. 
Um, there is one question from Wendy, which we can certainly come back to you, Wendy. Is there somewhere, somewhere local to purchase a DBH tape to work out a TPZ? Um, we can certainly come back to you on that. I haven't, I haven't found, I've only, I've got one that I found online. Um, you can get them fairly cheap. Um, you don't need anything fancy necessarily. Um, or you can just, you, you can do the, it's quite a simple equation to do, um, to do yourself if you have the, um, the circumference. Um, yeah, and a phone, you can, you can do it yourself if you're interested. Um, yeah, but yeah, you can get them online fairly cheap. And you, you do want, the one thing to keep in mind is you want at least six metres, uh, potentially even more. I mean, the tree that we looked at the other day was an 11 metre diameter breast height red gum and a tape wouldn't have done anything for that. So just measuring measuring the circumference with a, with a normal tape is, is sometimes all you can do for those massive trees. <laughs> Okay, I think we'll probably um, wrap up there with questions just to keep time on track. Um, but like I said, any outstanding questions, we will make sure to come back to you on and provide any information that we, we have that can be helpful. Um, thanks so much, Cam and Chris, uh, for all that amazing information. Um, and thank you all so much for attending. Um, it really is fantastic to have so much interest in what we're doing. Um, our work to protect large old trees has never been more important as it is right now. Um, there are lots of actions that you can take to support the future of hollow dwelling species. Ellie's just putting a few links into the chat. Um, so please explore those because uh, there's lots of actions that you can take. Attracting government funding for this type of bottom up uh, community-led conservation that we're doing is still very difficult, yet the work we do is integral uh, given how important private land conservation is to save threatened biodiversity. Um, it's only with the support of people like you, um, philanthropic individuals and bodies and communities and the people that we partner with um, that we can continue to take action and expand these efforts to create a future that's still rich in wildlife. Um, we hope that you'll consider making a tax deductible donation this evening um, to secure and consolidate the gains that we're making so we can continue to do this vital work. Uh, you can do this via our Chuff campaign. There's a link in the chat function to do this. And we really do greatly appreciate any support, how big or small. Um, it really is, yeah, significant to the work that we do. Um, and also a huge thank you to those who, um, who are currently supporting us. Um, if you've been inspired today and wish to speak to someone about getting involved, please contact Ali McKenna, um, whose details, Ali will put her details into the chat as well. Lots of information in the chat tonight. Um, thanks again for joining us and we hope you find, have found this discussion really helpful and insightful and please get in touch um, via our website or um, info at biolinksalliance.org.au. Thanks very much. Good night.